Hello, viewers. My name is Susan Gerpik, and I was an attendee at SciCon 2023. What you're about to see is a quick clip of George Robb, who was the MC for the event. A uh, very funny man, very talented man, George Robb, H R A B. And I walked into the venue. He was talking about Las Vegas, and I just took my iPhone and pointed it at the screen and recorded as much as I could without having my my arms go numb because I had no selfie stick or anything with me. So I am not a videographer. This is just meant to give you a taste of what PsyCon was like. So there's nothing professional, as you can probably tell, going on with my skills in this area. But I hope you can enjoy it. And I certainly... I'm glad that I can record these and have this memory of what was happening at PsyCon. Um, I have a playlist here. If you want to indulge in other videos, that would be fantastic. Um, they will start putting out the official videos of the talks probably about January 2024, and they will just rotate like every month or every few weeks, they'll put out another video. And they probably won't have this content in here. It's it's usually just the speakers. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel for Center for Inquiry. Um, whenever those videos come around, you can also look at all the past PsyCon videos that are there from on their channel while we're waiting for 2024, whenever these videos start getting released. Hope you enjoy. Please leave me comments. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll make something up if I don't know the answer. And <laughs> enjoy. The remnants of the uh, old Lone Mormon Fort are, uh, have been reconstructed downtown, and as long as you don't mention the show South Park or its creators, you're welcome to take a tour. Up until the turn of the century, much like many of my solo gigs, Las Vegas was a sparsely populated area. Its fortunes changed, however, with the arrival of William A. Clark. Clark was a mining magnate, as well as a guy whose portrait looks the same upside down as right side down. Look at that beard, is that a beard? Clark was the principal investor in the Union Pacific Railroad, mostly because he never got hugged as a child. Recognizing the potential of Las Vegas, Clark purchased land, secured water rights to the springs, and built the very first in and out burger. The city was founded on May 15th, 1905, officially beating the spread by three days. The following year, the Golden Gate Casino was opened, located on Fremont Street. It was part of the Hotel Nevada. Uh, the Hotel Nevada was considered the height of luxury at the time, meaning that spitting and horse excrement was only allowed in the lobby. The original building still stands today, but technically, so does Wayne Newton. <laughs> By the teens and twenties, Las Vegas acquired its notorious nickname, Sin City, famously named after the inventor of green felt, Auguste Saint-Cité. I love that joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> By the 1930s, Las Vegas had already established itself as a popular holiday destination, uh, mostly for residents of Los Angeles, uh, as well as folks looking to get divorced. Seriously, it was so easy to get divorced in Las Vegas that both Johnny Carson and Liza Minnelli set up franchises. For any younger people in the audience, Johnny Carson and Liza Minnelli used to be on television. <laughs> and television was this invention that used to broadcast entertainment. And entertainment was this thing that was made by humans. But I'm just kidding. There aren't any young people here. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving along to the 30s, the construction of Hoover Dam was a significant uh, development in the city's history. Uh, its building provided two key commodities desperately needed in Las Vegas, water and suckers. <laughs> Finished in 1936, the Hoover Dam is second only to Mitch McConnell's medical insurance as one of the largest and most ambitious expenses ever undertaken by the federal government. <laughs> By the 1940s, uh, as the demand for hotels, gambling, and unimaginably gigantic shrimp cocktails grew, venues had to expand past Fremont Street. The Strip, so named because visiting it often left you feeling naked and exposed, 
Soon we came home to casinos like the El Rancho, the Thunderbird, The Last Frontier, George Orwell's 1984, and the very casino we are all in, the Flaming O. <laughs> After the Second World War, many returning soldiers decided to settle in Las Vegas because during their tenure fighting fascism, they had already stared deep into the gaping jaw of humanity's awful potential, whose grim consequences and costs could only be supplicated by the raw unnerving of man's darkest tendencies, often leading towards fanatical self-slaughter and unholy devastation. So really, how much worse could it be at the Sands? Moderately <laughs> nicer than World War II, it says. An extremely attractive location for organized crime, by the 1940s, Las Vegas quickly became a city run by the mob. <laughs> I mean, uh, Las Vegas became an extremely attractive location for a completely legitimate businessman. <laughs> Uh, Las Vegas is still a bastion of hardworking and totally honest tradesmen just trying to make a living, so why don't you all just go ahead and mind your own business? In fact, some of the biggest names in the mob, uh, uh, in legitimate business, uh, like Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, Tony, Tony Antonio, Vinny the Serrated Knife Puccio, and <laughs> Carmine Don't Eat the Pudding Skin Rizzo, all played a key role in the development of the Las Vegas Strip, to which we're all obviously appreciative. Moving on. <laughs> Curiously, in the 1950s, uh, Nevis Air Force Base, located just outside the city limits, established something called the Nevada Test Site, which earned Las Vegas yet another nickname, Satan's Buffet. <laughs> no, sorry, it's uh, Atomic City. Atomic City. Sorry. Between uh, 1951 and 1992, the Nevada test site was the primary testing location for nuclear devices, potentially explaining both the peculiar taste of the slices inside the cake vending machines here, as well as the very existence of Barry Manilow. <laughs> Oddly enough, there was a time that mushroom clouds could be seen from downtown hotels, which became something tourists enjoyed watching, echoing the tastes of today's moviegoers. I mean, we all enjoyed watching this past summer's movie that was about the makers of a huge bomb. You know, the Flash. It <laughs> was an Indiana Jones 5. It's hard to beat those bombs through. Which, of course, brings us to Frank. When you talk about the 1950s and the formation of Las Vegas, one's mind instantly sees an image of Frank Pasquale, the first guy to split a pair of eights while playing blackjack. He was like the Neil Armstrong or Phil Helmuth of the Marquis of Queensburys. Uh, oh, I guess, I guess Sinatra, too. Actually, no history of Las Vegas can be told without mentioning Frank Sinatra. Uh, it's contractually part of the city ordinances. First appearing on stage in 1953 at the Sands Hotel, Frank Sinatra loved Las Vegas, and Las Vegas loved him, but not in a fruity way. <laughs> Sinatra headlined some of the biggest stages in the city, and along with fellow performers Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Joey Bishop, and the English one, established a successful rodent <laughs> extermination business. It was around this time that the iconic uh, Welcome to Las Vegas sign was constructed, installed in 1959 by the company Western Neon. It was actually designed by Betty Willis, an employee of that very company. Funnily enough, that sign has never marked the actual city limits of Las Vegas. So its location, much like where Spirit Airlines decided to deliver my lost luggage yesterday, is around four miles from Las Vegas. <laughs> Speaking of a neon-encrusted, shiny, bejeweled, and iconically manufactured behemoth, oh, there's the Liberace. It's difficult to imagine Las Vegas became what it is today without the one and only Liberace. Not impossible, just different. The world's highest paid entertainer for two decades, between the 60s and 70s, Liberace embraced a flamboyant lifestyle, both on and off the stage, that eventually became synonymous with the city itself, dressed in capes and costumes adorned with ostrich feathers, and chauffeur on the stage, and a Rolls Royce, and dropped in, flying on a wire. Nothing, except taste, was off limits. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're on funny taste, after a disappointing Las Vegas debut in 1959, the one and only Elvis Presley came back to Vegas 10 years later, and he performed 636 sold-out shows. 
It's important to remember that his captivating performances, rock and roll spirit, unique musical influence, and iconic flashy outfits all led to his eventual death on the toilet. <laughs> As the 1980s began, Las Vegas was struggling. It became a tourist trap with aging casinos, cheap restaurants with bad food, and showrooms filled with performers trying to squeeze a couple more years out of their careers. It's really hard to imagine, right? <laughs> Ooh, there's Penn and Teller on there. Eventually, however, hotels like the Mirage, the Excalibur, the Luxor, Steve Wynn's Tax Shelter, and New York's authentic Las Vegas, New York, New York, Manhattan, New York, opened and started to pull Vegas out of its slump. It was the Bellagio, however, originally built as a set for the Oceans movies, that shifted the focus to luxury and helped create the image of today's modern Las Vegas. You know, a city that apart from the crowds and the prices and the traffic and the desert and the grift and the commercialism and the ecological impact and the promotion and exploitation of statistical numeracy is just fantastic. <laughs> oh, and the Beatles' uh, Cirque du Soleil show is pretty cool, too. It is here then, in modern Las Vegas, that I'm honored and delighted to welcome you all to PSYCHON. Are you ready? Woo! Let's get started right away. So this year what I'm doing, uh, for every, every speaker that I'm introducing, 